Hello, everyone, and welcome to our session on land and environment. Um, we're also going to be talking very much about language in this session. I'm Warren Cario. I'm from the University of Manitoba, and I'm originally from Treaty 6 Territory in Meadow Lake, Saskatchewan, which is the location of the amazing story told by Joseph Nepauhau in our opening event on Wednesday. And the profound influence of that place on my life and on my work. I also want to acknowledge the, the organizations that have made this gathering possible. The Ireland Canada Foundation, the Centre for Creative Writing and Oral Culture at the University of Manitoba, um, the Centre for Canadian Studies in University College Dublin, and the Craig Dobbin Visiting Professor. Um, we'd like as many people as possible to join LandSpeak, and so we're pleased to offer all of our sessions free. Um, but if you would like to support our, our work here, um, you can make a donation to, to help support the cost of the event, and we'll be posting a link uh, in, in Hop In for you to do that throughout the day. So in this session, we have an amazing opportunity to hear from two of what I th who I think are the most profound thinkers on the relationships between land and traditional languages. Mankan McGann is an Irish writer and documentary filmmaker who has published widely dozens of documentary films on issues of world culture. Mankan has recently published a truly wonderful and original book called 32 Words for Field which is focused on the ways in which the Irish language is connected deeply to the land. Jeanette Armstrong is a Seelks Okanagan writer, professor, and activist who has done amazing work on the relationships between her people's language in Silchin and the Seelks Okanagan territory. Jeanette's classic poetic essay, Speaking, was our inspiration for naming this gathering and speak. And so we're very honored that, um, that she is able to join us today and that she was okay with us doing that. <laughs> um, there's so much more that I could tell you about our panelists, but I think it's best for you to hear from them directly. So what we'll do is we'll have uh, Jeanette open our discussion and then uh, Mon Khan will, uh, will uh, have uh, another maybe 10 or 12 minutes or so. And then, um, and then we'll bring Jeanette back for some further conversation and then we'll, uh, we'll take it from there. So uh, without further ado, uh, welcome to Mankan and Jeanette. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, I will turn the, uh, the floor over to Jeanette. Thank you, Warren. Thank you, Warren. And I just, first of all, want to give greetings to everyone in my language and give uh, gratitude to the organizers and, and um, for this wonderful opportunity. Limlim yayat ipiatska kenea ipiatska kenea ekskolkoiltimentum eko huitskitum yan kolkoiltim te dala uyat kaknula huitskatska kenea apna. So I just want to also uh, thank the organizers uh, for uh, supporting this and, and the people that are that are supporting it and the people that are listening in. I want to also give you. Uh, greetings, and uh, really am privileged, I think, today to be able to speak about this topic with uh, Mankan, and thank you for uh, being here as well. As you know, I'm indigenous uh, to the part of um, the West Coast area, the Interior Plateau, um, in our language called uh, this Okanagan, the Okanagan Valley, and I live in and uh, my ancestry is, is from the Okanagan through my father's side and um, the, uh, through my mother's side through the Arrow Lakes. And I just also want to mention the territory to give you some idea that it, it, uh, the, the Nsilchen language, the language that I spoke, is part of a larger group of languages that um, formed a, a really pretty big area here on the west coast of North America. Um, just to give you some idea, the 25 languages that form the Salish and Salish and 
group, um, of which in Seelchen is one, um, occupied the about half of um, British Columbia, all the way to the coast, uh, from the Rocky Mountains all the way to the coast in the province of British Columbia and, and also uh, down into um, most of Washington State uh, out uh, uh, to where it borders, um, the river borders uh, Oregon and about half of the state of Idaho and a big part of northern, uh, the northern parts of uh, the, the states next to that Montana. And so those 25 languages, um, I can understand about uh, four of the interior ones. I speak not fluently, but fairly well, uh, three of them, and, and, and of course, including my language. And so that's a vast area. And, and part of that is also to mention that, uh, according to the archaeologists and linguists, there has been Salish and speaking people here for as long as glaciation receded, which is like around 12,000 years. So that language had a long time to um, become part of us, the, the 25 different uh, Salish languages. So I, that's kind of the context that I, I wanted to uh, provide, first of all. And as I mentioned in uh, land speaking, uh, what I really want to talk about is how the language of my ancestors informs me, how it embraces me, and how it permeates my experience of the Okanagan land, and how the land is a constant voice within me. It's a voice that always yearns to be spoken to others. And I know that language is central to meaning making as seal, who we are as seal, are embedded in the language, embedded in the understanding of our part, our place. And in that way also I'll be talking about how our stories, our origin stories, uh, called chaptik, our teaching stories, um, give us an understanding that arose very clearly and definitely from the land. And so I thought I would share some thoughts in, in some of the articles that I've published uh, beforehand um, in terms of uh, this particular topic and how language informs writing and how language informs my writing, but also its importance, uh, how language, indigenous languages are so important at this time. I think the idea of how the silk view of land occurs in, for instance, a word that we use for what sometimes is translated as the land um, is um, our temhula. And you can hear in that first part of the word, uh, the word temih, temh, and then ula, right? So I just wanted to explain the images that arise in that. And it's kind of foundational to that whole idea of our connection to environment. So that idea of temih, we use that word, and um, I looked at um, the uh, Salish and Proto-Salish and uh, dictionary that was proposed by the linguist uh, Art Kuypers mentions that um, he pulled together specific roots from all 25 languages working with other linguists and and and. and dictionary of what might have been the original Proto-Salish and the first language that all 25 was part of. And that word to me was in all 25 languages, as do a whole number of other words. So that language hasn't 
changed a lot over over that you know time that it changed into 25 different pieces and so that idea to me for our people is speaking about what we're looking at when we're looking at nature when we're looking at the environment when we're looking at what area territory place we live in and that word to me was contained in the word for the physical properties of land but to me for us really is um, a spiritual aspect of the land it's a it's an image that shows us the way that we should think about it and the way that we should understand the meaning of this life that's that we're part of that we're that we're immersed in and that we're engaged in that idea of to me that middle part of the word that me um, is a word that uh, is a root that we use in in all words related to the truth related to fact related to the idea of something we know so if I said it's me steen it means I know right and uh, me might it's 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 obvious it's easy it, it, to know it, it it's verifiable by fact so that middle part points to the truth of what's around us and then when it's constructed into me it it also refers to the 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 fact of many 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 strands that are present but uncountable and not you're not able to count for instance how many ants there are how many birds there are how many trees there are it's possible but it's it's not something that um, is is visible to you in terms of numbers but you know that it's it's so so vast in terms of the actual verifiable quantity that quantities that are there so that idea of to me is is about the thousands and millions and trillions of things that are surrounding us and continuously regenerating themselves in in different ways and that word in Timhula, to me in ul the middle part of that word ul refers to a spiral how things revolve over and over and over again so it refers to the seasons and the cycles the days and the the years the months the moons all of those different cycles cycles of birth life and death and so when we say Timhula, that last part ala refers to this place right here right now not yesterday not tomorrow not next year but the idea of those things that are continuing to move and move and regenerate themselves in those cycles and the space that you're in right this moment is now so it's a very different view of of how how the uh, idea of land and how lang our language uh, imparts that information to us it expresses and mimics the land's knowledge so i i wanted to stop there and then continue on after you know after um, mankin has has a chance to talk about language and land i am bamboozled by that like that is that's giving me a whole new way of looking at the world tam hula i just love i just love to hear you talk about that um Forever and ever, but I know it. We have this tiny platform, Agus. Um, there's so much to cover. So, so how do you provide lumps some of where has a cardinal? Div shigler dumps is more in a nor. Um, on on desha have I gone? Irishin teami agus rudi a flay in in over marsha. So I just first want to give my sincere thanks. Like for me, this is the greatest honor to be able. To be given an opportunity to to explore some of these issues, and I am like humbled when when I, I listen to Jeanette because I realise, I, I you know I am just poking around in some of these things, and when I when I um when I sense the rootedness and the depth 
of uh, Jeanette's wisdom. It is humbling. But nonetheless, what I first, I suppose, want to make the point about is that there is no sense of equivalence between Irish culture and native cultures of anywhere in the world. You know, the Irish people have been here a long time, and it's interesting to hear Jeanette speak about how their people have been there since the last Ice Age for 12,000 years. I mean, in some way, people have been on this island in Ireland for the same amount of time, 10,000 years. The Ice Age retreated in Ireland the same time as Canada, 12,000 years ago. Um, and we have links to those first people, but at the same time, we're not quite them. We, the Irish, are the people who arrived um, 4,000 years ago, and we came from the Pontic Steppe, from this area of, um, you know, between Russia and Turkey that extended between, between the two. Um, and we, there were people here before us. And so we have the DNA of those people who arrived 4,000 years ago, these, these um, Bronze Age uh, farmers, first farmers. But we have some of the DNA of the people who came before us who were these brown-eyed, brown-skinned Neolithic people from the Middle East. And then before them again were the original hunter-gatherers who preceded them, their dark-skinned, blue-eyed people. Again, there's just trace elements, if anything, of them um, within, within us. But who we are, I suppose, is the only thing we know is um, what our, our, our sagas, our old myths are telling us. And they are giving us quite a good link. I know clearly our oral literature survived for long enough, but then... Um, down with the arrival in, in the field. And most of our, our oral traditions and our oral knowledge was obviously preserved orally through the mouths of people from, from generation to generation, from mouth to mouth. But I suppose um, the, the, the easiest way of accessing it is the written forms that were written down in the 11th century. And they tell of um, basically in the book Lamar Kawala, which talks about the first people who arrived in it. Not us, but the people who arrived before us. And these were, um, there was Dra and his sister Sarah and their father B. And they arrived in Munster, they arrived in Ireland. And what's interesting is that B means everything. B means eternity, it means everlasting being, it means existence, it means the cosmos. So B, these people were basically the coming of life to the island after the Ice Age, after the wipeout, after Ireland was left, when the ice sheet retreated and we were left with, with this tundra, with this bleak expanse. But our people came, it's said that they came in 700 BC. Um, now, in reality, we know they came 4,000 years ago, but, you know, dates weren't the important thing. The important thing was the first people of us who came were was Amergain, was our first druid, our first um, poet, basically, who believed in the power of words. The power of words was so potent that they could actually sum up landscape. And so he arrived on the shore in the same place that Be, who was the cosmos, who was everything, who was all of existence, arrived before, before Amergain. Amergain, the druid, comes or arrives there with whoever survived from a shipwreck. And he summons the world into life through words. He says, Am gwe am win, am ton trehem, am fuim mara, am dav shach nirans. So these words that were recorded in the 11th century AD, but actually go way, way back. The Irish in them is far older than the 11th century. These words are at least 2,000 years old, potentially, and, and maybe lot older. And what he's saying is, Am gwe am win, I am the wind on the sea, am ton trehem. I'm the strong wave. I'm Fuim Mara. I'm the sound of the sea. I'm Gav Shach Mirand. I'm the stag of seven times. He is basically bringing the world, bringing the land to life. And that concept that our poets, originally our Druids, but then with Christianity, we weren't, the Druids were not able to practice anymore, so they started calling themselves, but maintained that same belief in the power of the word. And so we see this again in um, the ancient law tracts, which are the other truly ancient oral tradition that has managed to survive up until the present day because they were recorded in books in, you know, the first in the, say, 5th, 6th century, but the records we have are really 11th, 12th century. And the Shanachas Moor was the great collection of, of traditional lore of our people, and particularly the laws. And in it, there's a, a section of 
questions and answers. And one is the, one question is, what is the preserving shrine? In other words, what preserves the knowledge of our people who have been here for 4,000 years, who, who still have the DNA and the folkloric memory of the people who were before them, who were there for another 4,000 years before them, and then even back to the hunter-gatherers who were there maybe 1,000, 2,000 years before them. And it says, what is the preserving shrine of their memories? And it says, not hard. It is um, not hard. It is memory and what is preserved in it. Okay, so we preserve our knowledge and our lore and our connection with everything, with the cosmos, with the, through the language. And then it says the second question. So it, the idea is that memory was the key bulwark, the key preserver for maintaining a sense of tribal identity, of tracing lineages, of spiritual and military leadership of tracking patterns of climate change and vegetation growth, of collating and conserving the cures and the remedies that our women held uh, for us, held in, in, preserved for us. To know the world meant memorizing the world. And the Shanachas Moore emphasizes this through re-putting re that question. What is the preserving shrine, it says? And the answer again that would have been learnt by every poet you know, uh, an ancestor of the Druids was, what is the preserving shrine? Not hard is the memory and what is preserved in it? Question one. Question two, what is the preserving shrine? Again, not hard, it is nature and what is preserved in it. Basically, what it shows is that the knowledge was, um, the knowledge of who we were was preserved in the landscape. Again, this is no new concept. You'll find this among people all over the world. Um, but particularly the Druids, they collected the memory and it was paramount for their allure, for the authority of their histories, their authority as spellcasters, as storytellers, as genealogists, that they keep this information. And we're just so blessed, in fact, to the Christian church that they did write it all down for us. They, they had their own agendas and they mightn't have written it down as purely as they could have. But through this, we get a sense of the key place that lore was preserved, as I said, was in the landscape. It was in place names, in the Din Shanachas. And the Din Shanachas is the lore of notable places. There are 70,000 place names in Ireland. And what language experts claim is that a lot of these go at least back to 700 AD, some of them older again. And contained within each place name, if one can unpack it, is the knowledge of the people who lived in there, the animals that were there, and the impact that places will have on us if we tune into them today. They summon the land to life through the stories and through the songs that are all tied up with them. A little bit like, potentially like the song lines or the Churunga lines of Aboriginal. But again, we cannot, I do not, I'm not trying to make any equivalence. There is just, if we as as Irish people, as unusual Europeans who have this foot in an ancient world, want to get some sense of the richness of the Din Shanachas, we can look at native people who also who also share this this profound knowledge of um, of 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 their place and their existence there and of the wider cosmos through the the stories and the places. I'll give you just two examples quickly before before I end. One is a simple one. Bale. Bale and the Briskin. Now it's an English word, in, in English it's a Bale and the Briskin. It's a little village, even just a, an area between Kong and Clare Morris in Mayo. And if you translate it into English, it goes, well, if you translate it into Irish first from the sort of garbled Bale and the Briskin, it's Bale, Oha and Briskin. The town, or Baile, Oha and Briskin, the town of the ford of the wild tansy. And wild tansy, you know, it's a flat topped yellow flower that smells of camphor and a bit of rosemary. But it was vital to know the information that the wild tansy was there because it was a cure for joint pain. And if you wrapped up meat in it, it has this toxic compounds that repel insects and maggots. It could also induce abortions and miscarriages when taken in high doses. So for women to know that Baal and the Briskin, from this place name, if you unpacked it, there were these secrets, this secret knowledge that would empower one. In the same way, Loch and La in County Cavan um, is another example of something that has all of this extra knowledge inside it. Loch and La or Loch and Lega, Loch and Lea in Irish um, means the place name, or the loch, the, the small lake of the Leia, of the, or the la, the, the cure of the lice, or the Leia, the, the physician. This, this water 
had powerful curative properties. Again, there are stories told in the 19th century that was to do with church, but actually we can see Neolithic symbols and signs in the landscape to show that actually this lake was a worship site for not only 2,000, not only 4,000, but back 6,000 years. It is all there in the place names if they're just unpacked. And possibly later I might, I might take a moment to unpack some really powerful words that actually give us an entire new way of looking at our landscape and our place in it. But I'd love to hear Jeanette talk more about land and language. Thank you both so much. That's an absolutely wonderful opening. And, uh, and just I want to, uh, to bring uh, awareness to our, our listeners that you know, there will be some time for question and answer at the end here. So please do post your, your questions in the chat. Um, but with that, yes, I'd like to turn back to, uh, to Jeanette and uh, uh, have part two here from her. <laughs> Wow, that's so fascinating. I'd like to just listen to you. Um, I wanted to also mention too that uh, I, I, you know, I want to acknowledge that uh, I I have Irish ancestry. My grandfather William James Armstrong uh, came in the late 1800s from around Donegal. Him and his older brother uh, William, uh, who my father is named after, William. James Armstrong is my father's name, and uh, but he died uh, when my father was about six years old, and so he didn't really get to know his Irish grandfather. But the older his older uh, brothers and sisters got to know uh, some things and heard some stories, and and our grandmother always talked about him. He lived in our community and is buried here in our reservation on our on our tribal lands. And so I just wanted to mention that when I visited Donegal <laughs> at one time. But I wanted to talk about uh, the idea of uh, Chaptik, that idea that you were, you know, referring to the idea of the oral tradition, the oral stories, and, and how, uh, not only how language um, is a part of, our language is a part of that, but how it also is a way to, um, for us as Seal people to be able to uh, engage in our understanding of our identity of being of the land, that idea of uh, relatedness, um, of uh, viewing ourselves as, as humans, as a part of a subset of relatedness within larger living nature. That idea of uh, Chaptikl, I wanted to just break the word down a little bit. That idea of uh, Tiku is like a, a spark or an ember, uh, you know, flying off or a spark or an en ember left after the fire has died down. And so that's the image of that, that last part of the word Chaptikl. And the first part just means a splitting off from anything. So that image of an ember splitting off is uh, what it comes up when you, when you say the word japtik. And what it means in our language is the knowledge that we have can be split off in these stories and can be breathed on in the future generations and it can shed light and it can bring light to darkness and, in other words, knowledge. It can bring knowledge about the things that the previous storytellers carried forward. So the idea of our chapter isn't isn't so much in terms of myth and, you know, in my dissertation I talk a lot about that. It, it's really about the idea of our knowledge of our good relationship with the land, our right relationship with the land that uh, can be passed forward in Chaptik so that, as you will know if you read any of our stories, our Chaptik stories, the idea of uh, the characters, some people call them animism, uh, animated characters, they're, they're characters of birds and insects and animals and fish and trees and you know, all the things that surround us become um, 
persons become speakers of how they interact, how they interrelate. And so in, in a lot of ways, when, when, when those characters are within the characters we know out there, for instance, Raven, which is a bird that's a real opportunist. It, it'll, in, in the stories, it'll fly in and take away the food from smaller birds. And um, so that character of that that uh, bird will always be the same through the stories because that's how Raven is, right? Different from other birds or animals or insects in terms of what they really are out there. And so they and their interactions mimic what's happening out there continuously in nature. So they inform us continuously in the stories about our own ethic, our own values, our own morals, and our own information about the land, where the medicines are, where the, the things that we seek as, as people to be able to thrive, to be able to live, to be able to give gratitude, our spiritual places. Those animals and birds and insects that interact in those stories are telling us where these things are, are speaking and showing to us how we're to interact with them, how we're to be as, as human beings. And I think of it um, in, in that particular way in which uh, we can look at uh, oral tradition and we can look at folklore, we can look at how language informs that in really profound ways in indigenous languages. And I, I think it's just an incredible thing that we're losing when we lose any indigenous language or any area of stories and folklore that are related come from the land because the land is what gives us those, those stories. The land is what tells us who we are. The living Tmih and the Timhula is what is our language. It is our language. It mimics the land's language. So in that, we know that we are not only part of that land, where we are keepers of that knowledge. And, and we, in our language and our stories, pass that knowledge forward. Um, as David Abrams mentions in The Spell of the uh, Sensuous, language is life. It's our life. It's no more true that we speak language about the things around us and the animate world itself is speaking within us. It is the land that is speaking when we speak our indigenous language. And so in these times, I think it's really incredibly important that we need to listen to the voices of the land that we need to think about how the stories of, of the places, all these different places that, uh, that are uh, embedded, that knowledge that's embedded for those people in those areas can rekindle a new fire from the small embers still glowing there in each of our midst. It's a time for a new fire for all of us inside this dark age. So it's a time for Chaptik from all corners of the earth. So in terms of lifting that veil of spirituality um, in how we see the sacred, one of the things about the language is that it puts us in a different dimension and the stories take us to that place in our mind and in our psyche that tells us who we really are, that gives us that experience of the sacred knowledge that surrounds us, that we're part of, that, that we get to be a part of for a short time. And to be able to see the powerful and invisible web of reciprocity that's sustaining life around us, is to be able to understand the rightness 
of our reverent conduct within it. So those are things that I thought was extremely important to be able to say uh, to, to people that we need to rethink how our stories talk about the places that we're in to be able to reconnect us in the right way to those places as people, no matter where we're from, the places that we're in need us to speak, to speak to the generations about what they need and how they need to be understood and that, that they can speak through us. So I'll turn it back over to Mankon. Mm. There's an Irish expression, ta and a tocht is a, it's just this, this feeling in the throat, this emotion in the throat. And when you talk, I just feel it so strongly inside of me. Um, it's, again, humbling is the word that's coming up. So we're, uh, we're a people who haven't even begun to think along the lines of the, the insights and the wisdom that you're sharing there. Um, and we know we need to. And so, you know, in, in your writing, when you, when you, um, when you mention that, uh, um, that, the, that, that what, I think you quote uh, John Kruger, the old stories are not in the past, but in the present and bring the past to the present. Like in just what you said there again, that we made a mistake in saying that these stories, the, the chaptic stories are coming from the past. They're not, as you say, they are the stories of now, the stories that give the insights now. And I realize that it's the same with uh, the I I Irish. So I, we call them myths and sagas and legends, but of course that's not what they are. Um, it was easy for first the Christians to write them down in nice stories and say they were myths and legends. And it was easy then for the, our national school system, which was based um, you know, which was brought in by England in 1831 and is based on that to teach us that these stories are just nice myths and sagas for Hollywood to make story, to make movies out of. And in fact, listening to you makes me realize there is such a deeper truth to them. So for example, um, one way of illustrating this is, is the Boyne. The Boyne River is the sacred river of Ireland. Um, you know, where Newgrange and the great, the great um, Neolithic sites are on the side of this, of this beautiful flowing river that goes through County Mean. And the Irish for Boyne is a Boyne. It's, the, the, it's actually the Boinda, which is the female goddess, the great maternal mother earth goddess. And so the river is a manifestation of this river. Now, we're never told this in school. We're never told this in, in, um, in, you know, in, 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 in academia, really you know, outside of folklore departments. And there, we're not, we never stress that it's a woman, the Boindas and mother goddess, and all of the great myths and sagas of Ireland, there is always a mother goddess, a powerful female form. No one ever talks about this to us, because of course, they're all about the mother earth, about respecting the power of the mother earth, and it wasn't in people's interest to share this knowledge with us. So but the Boinda, the Boinda was the mother goddess, and she created the river by the stories go, which are, you know, either um, Christian written down in the 11th century and then translated into English by men in the 19th century, Victorian men or, or early 20th century. One of them, my great cousin, my great grand uncle, T.F. O'Reilly was one of the primary ones. But they, they kept on this male idea. So what they say is the Boinda, the mother goddess got curious. She wanted knowledge beyond herself and goes down to the well of knowledge, the well of insight that connects with the underworld, that connects with all realms above and below. And as a result of her cheek, of her daring, of her, of, her, of, her willing, of her want to look at bigger knowledge beyond the small narrow and narrowness of the everyday, she was drowned and her body was left in the landscape as a reminder to us all not to seek extra knowledge. And what you get from this is the Boinda is the Irish mother goddess, yeah? But she's the exact same goddess as the Govinda, as the Indian Hindu goddess, which is a form of Krishna. Because, of course, we are the same people. And mm -hmm. as Jeanette said there, if you go into these stories, one begins to see that everything becomes one. And so in a small scale, Irish people realize we have the exact same culture as Hindu culture. I could, I could spend the next hour talking about the words that are similar in Hindu, and they're based in Sanskrit, and that are in Irish too. 
But the stories, we have the same law systems, we have the same stories because we are one people that just roam, um, moved out from the center. And then, of course, if you go there, then you go, you just keep on going further. From India, you're going into China, you're going around the world, and all of these stories will bring us back to realize we are one, which, of course, was what governments or small education systems that wanted to control us never wanted, never wanted us to know. The other way of seeing this is to the Kailach, the other, the basis of so many stories. The Kailach is another form of the mother goddess. In fact, you, you could almost say she's sometimes equivalent to she slept with Lug, with the great god of the sea, as did Anya, as did um, the Dagda, as did uh, the Boinda. They were all versions of the same female goddess. And she, um, again, brings to life there is the, the, the stories that they tell, that the, is said about the Kailach. The Kailach says she's very old. And some, some of the really ancient stories, she tries to explain how old she is. And she says, um, she says there's an Irish version that says, in Kailach Vyog Unfosik, the little, the little Kailach, the little hooded um, mother goddess or witch, really, of the wilderness. And she says, Dur va on Faragavur na Kailachinich las. We miss it in the Vornigog. The time when the great sea was a great mossy wood, I was a young girl. What she's saying is that time before the Atlantic Ocean was created. The time where the Faragamur, the big sea, was a wooded landmass. That was then, which it was, the Atlantic Ocean was a wooded landmass. It was then torn asunder to create the Eurasian plates and the North American plates, which is why the exact same rock formations and fossils are found on the west coast of Ireland, in Donegal and parts of Sligo, as are also found in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Kentucky and the Appalachians of the Carolinas and the Virginias. We were one people. The mythological stories that we have somehow have contained, have maintained that knowledge for, that is geological time. That's beyond the whole mindset that we can even imagine of. And yet it has been proven that the Aboriginal people of Australia do have memories that go back to so I, I agree and i'm just so moved when jeanette talks about that these stories they're not something to do with the past they're absolutely relevant to now and all they do is widen our horizons and make us realize how you how much we are dependent on the world on the earth and how unified we are thank you both Go ahead, Jeanette. I was going to ask if, if you have thoughts to respond here. Before I lose my thought about that, um, I wanted to mention that I, I, I'm really fascinated by that idea um, of how, how those stories moved and moved with us over many, 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 many millennia. And um, one story that we have is very, very similar, uh, the story of older brother and younger brother. And um, we have examined that story, the scholars of Nsilchin story, the Suhcha which is, I'm one of them. Uh, the, the idea of uh, the older brother and the younger brother, and in that story, the, the younger brother is um, sent to step across a, you know, a water. And then when the older brother turns and looks, there's nothing but water between them. And um, in, a, in our story, uh, it's, it's uh, mentioning that the, young, the younger brother will someday in our future come back to us and that, you know, we will be reunited. And uh, that our role as uh, the older brother, which is said in the story that we're the older brother, they'll come back to us from the east. And uh, that our role is to be able to share our knowledge of the sacred and our knowledge of, of the land and how to be on the land so that we can um, make the world whole again. So it, it's really an interesting story. We think about, you know, the separation of, of um, the, you know, the, originally when what Pangaea was and then the separation into the, the European and Asian continents and, and African continents. So how those stories emerge are, are so interesting and interesting to me in terms of a, a, the topic of discussion as well as that 
new idea about all these different realities and dimensions that um, exist in 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 within us and exist as a part of the land. Yeah. Oh, I mean, it's so potent, isn't it? This is, um, and it's such an exciting time to be realizing these elements, like realizing that because Ireland had this, the other world was as important as the real world, as the, well, can you even call it real world? Every word, um, it's, as, it's as Jeanette was saying there, there was this circular thing, a concept of constant movements and motion and seasons and cycles within a word, which means it can never be pinned down. There, is, there are processes within the words. And I suppose the key thing for us, the key tool, the urgent tool for us to take out of this now is the ecological significance. And I, I mean, I'd, I'd be so interested to know what, um, what, 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 what information or what insights is the Silchin language giving into the ecology I'll just, I'll just briefly say that one, one element that I find really strong in, in Irish lore is the story about the Glasgainach, which is, Glasgainach was a particular magical cow. And again, because so much of our roots are in, in uh, Hindu, in Indian culture, we too had the cow as a sacred figure. Um, the, the Boinda River, as I said, shines up into the sky to create Bailach Nabo Finna, the, the way, the, the track of the, of the white cow. But the Glasgainach was this magical cow who nourished her people with her milk, just as the boy in River 2 was the magical mother goddess who nourished her people with her water on either side of the river. And she did so forever, for generations, to anybody who needed nourishment, who needed nurturing, could come to the glass kind of, until finally a man comes. Of course, a man, uh, um, an exploitative man, comes and realizes there's a way he can take advantage of this ever bountiful, ever giving Mother Earth uh, creature, the Glas Kainach. And he, he says, will you fill up my vessel? And of course she, she agrees, she will never refuse anybody. And he gives her a sieve. And she, he milks the cow and he milks the cow and he milks the cow and the milk all comes out of the sieve and it keeps on flowing and it keeps on flowing until eventually there's blood coming out of the cow. And the cow is withered and exhausted and finally she dies. And uh, the, the, the man gets nothing because there's only holes in his sieve. The Glas Gainach is, a, is an otherworldly figure. So she just re-manifests herself immediately and takes her calf that she had been giving some of the milk to and goes off the cliff into the sea and never comes back to support humans again. It's this story that we've been trying to tell each other for so long. Thank you both. Um, there's so much to uh, to unpack in the the observations that you both made uh, about the the way that the the land actually provides us with language, and that it is that ongoing relational embodied process of us being aware of the land that actually maybe in a sense allows us to to continue having language and using language. Um, and uh, there's so much I would like to ask you, but we also have some uh, some wonderful questions here from our uh, audience. So I want to um, uh, ask this uh, question or pose this question that Diane Charles asks. Um, she says, how has the supremacy of the written language and especially the English language separated us from the sacredness of the land and world and distorted our view of all our relationships? Um, so uh, Jeanette, would you like to respond first or? Oh, sure. Um, I think uh, for us, it has only been like about uh, 30 years since uh, we uh, worked to develop, uh, you know, a lexicon and then um, accepted uh, a writing system so that it could be um, written and used in, um, in our education programs. And for, you know, for example, we have the uh, new uh, four-year undergraduate degree that we're going to be launching here at UBC Okanagan, the first, I think, of its kind in which uh, people can gain uh, fluency through those four years, because language itself was colonized, as you know. It was much more the impact of um, colonizing and the... Um, you know, the, the laws that were made to remove language from within our midst through the residential school programming. So 
that had much more of an impact on us um, and still is having a huge impact on the loss of indigenous languages here in this country. And so I would say that, um, yeah, it, it, it has an, an, uh, an incredible damaging effect um, to our people. And you can see it in all of the statistics, you know, that surround us because we can't connect to our land. We can't connect to who we are. We can feel it. We can yearn for it. And uh, a lot of our people feel that grief and die from that grief, you know, in all the different ways that you can think of. And so, um, yeah, uh, that, that needs to be thought about. And there needs to be reconciliation with the indigenous peoples and their languages here in Canada. Oh. The, 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 the quality of the trauma is so different like what's so valuable in one way about um, the the Okanagan tribes is they accept the trauma that has happened which you have lost and in Ireland we so we haven't even realized that we had a rich lore that it, as I said there's no equivalence we are definitely the younger brothers the smaller brothers we can only go back we can go back you know to that, I suppose, Indo-European culture that was there four or five thousand years ago. We can't go any further, and you can go a lot further. But um, we haven't even begun to think about what we've lost by, by that loss. With regard to the specific question of writing, it's complicated because, as I said, you remember I was saying, what was the preserving shrine was the, uh, the question asked to Druids. And first it was memory, and then it was landscape. The memory was preserved in the landscape. You looked at things, and they could bring them back to life. Now it is writing. Thanks to this oppressive force of the Christian church who wrote down our knowledge. Um, but we realize now that so much was lost by only it being written. So the poet, who was the, you know, the next generation of the Druid, they composed in darkness. They went inside to get their knowledge. They recited their words and they never wrote down the poems. They said them. They sang them. The whole idea was that they were manifested in sound. Um, and they said them often blindfolded and looking away. It was the idea that darkness looking into the other world was where you got the true knowledge. So like Kailach, the stories about this, the origin stories about this, which the Kailach meant so much more. The Kailach was an ancient hag, but she was also the young Bridget, the young um, spark of spring. And none of this was mm, put, put into the writing. So in one way, it's been a distortion because one, a text has been written down and it has limited all the multifarious nuances that, that went with that. With that. Thank you both. Uh, fascinating observations and so important uh, in terms of our understandings of our own communities and the, the, the work that needs to be done. Um, we've got some more, some more uh, excellent questions, and uh, so I want to uh, to move and pose another question here uh, by uh, from Danielle Fuller. Um, Danielle says, "Given the depth of the connection you're describing between language and land, how do you understand the importance of the Geltacht in the preservation and flourish, or perhaps in the context of Turtle Island, the importance of land back initiatives?" And treaties. Yeah, so you know, last year during the big COVID year, I spent most of the year doing a project called Sea Tamagotchi, collecting coastal words along the coastline of Mayo, of Donegal, and of, um, of Galway. In fact, the most beautiful and richest words I got were in Donegal. But what I'm talking to old fishermen in these places, and what I do, I put these words up on Instagram and on Twitter at, at malcon.com and I created a little book of, of some of the most alluring words. But what I found was the fishermen told me, they often said, they said like um, there was a man, John Vabajak in Connemara, in Letter Mullen, and he said to me, the word ski and corley. Ski and corley was a particular type of tool very, that was used for getting kelp, which was the kelp was then used for, for um, feed for cattle, but really for, for fertilizing the land. And um, he said he hadn't heard, that tool hadn't been used in 80 years. And he hadn't heard the word said in 50 or 60 years. So all of the practices that happened in the Gweltacht, in the Irish speaking areas on the west coast of Ireland, they all, the words went with specific practices. 
And as the government has got rid of all of those practices, the words went with it. So it is vital that those Guelts of that the Irish speaking areas be revived, be fostered again, and some of those practices be reintroduced um, for the words to survive. But it's not only vital from a linguistic point of view, but actually from living sustainably on an Atlantic island in the way that we have managed to do for 4,000 years. And some of our DNA ancestors, you know, for the last 4,000 years before them, we need urgently to get back to those practices. It just happens the words that of how to do that, of how to live sustainably on the soil, are encoded within the Irish language. So the, there's an urgency to, to definitely not just reviving Irish in Dublin schools or in universities, but actually in those areas where it's still vibrant and alive. Jeanette, do you have a response to that in relation to land back narratives and or, or um, repatriation of the land and um, and and honoring the treaties and all of the issues that are so important in in our indigenous communities in Turtle Island? Yeah, I think uh, there's a couple of different ways to think about it. Uh, one is within the you know political economy of of Canada, in which. Um, the best sense would be in terms of uh, conservation and biodiversity and protection of, you know, of uh, the land itself as a result of the things we have to do, you know, to uh, mitigate what's happening in climate change and to change the way, you know, people interact with it. So that's one discussion there in terms of land back. It makes a lot of sense. Um, uh, because there's some really good studies, uh, science studies that produce data that lands managed by indigenous people in comparison to lands managed by non-indigenous people and in comparison to wilderness spaces uh, have uh, real, you know, the 10%, the 7 to 10% of um, more richness in terms of, you know, the biodiversity. But in terms of uh, the way that we can think about it ourselves as seal people is that we want all people to come to the land in the way that we do so that there isn't this division um, in, you know, in the future of how people need to be on the land that is us so that we become, all of us become aware of the respect that's required um, and I think the language and the stories and the inclusion of our knowledge in all the aspects of things that are that are being done, um, you know, in the areas that we occupy and live needs to have our language, needs to have our stories, needs to have our knowledge, needs to have our people as a part of it. So land back in that sense um, is, a, is a different concept, uh, you know, not so much about land ownership or or treaties or those things that those are necessary as i said but in terms of land back we we are going to be here together in the future for a long time forward and so the idea of bringing the land back inside each of the people who live there you know in the same way that i feel it is going to make that difference so, yeah, I, I absolutely agree. So that means a lot of other structures need to include our language, our stories, our knowledge, and our interaction with each other in a more respectful way. Thank you. Um, I think we're just uh, getting close to the end of our time here, um, but we have uh, one, one last question. Um, and I, I know we won't have time to answer it in detail, but I'm interested in your thoughts on, on Paul Hangel's question. Um, wondering if knowledge can ever really be lost if it is contained in the land. Um, can you have a response to that? Yeah, that's, again, it's a beautiful synchronicity to the question because it's exactly what I wanted to, to focus on finally, which is, you know, one of the great riches, richnesses, <laughs> is that the right word, of, uh, of Jeanette's writing for us in Ireland as a teaching tool is when she talks, uh, today's talk is about writers on land and environment, yeah? But one cannot understand that without taking in the spiritual and um, without even to use the spiritual, without the beyond rational. 
And so it was, you know, when Jeanette earlier was talking about, as I said, that cycles that go on within the word, this connection with the, with the bigger, with the universal. And she also writes about how characters, that beings in stories are, are invisible when they're rooted in, um, in all dimensions. So beings in the stories, the animals, which aren't quite animals and per, which aren't quite people, uh, exist in the story when they're in the story, but then they're invisible would be on that. And that's what we need to understand all over the world, but in Ireland too. The sense that we, we can look at nature and look at our place in nature, in the land with language, but actually the idea is the invisible. It's the spirit. It is the animating force behind that. And if we can tune into that, and again, potent stories can help us do that, we can get that bigger, we can get that bigger um, insight. So yes, the language, the stories are preserved in the land. How do we access them from the land? Through the same way the Druids did, close your eyes and go inside. It requires a level of intuition, a level of a spiritual journey. And the land, our forefathers, the existence of humanity wants that information to rise within us again. It won't, it isn't just two words. It isn't just true language. It's being in landscape and allowing it happen is my feeling. So um, what, what I wanted to uh, end with is just the idea that uh, uh, when, when we put ourselves in, in that space, when we go out to fast on the land as seal people, as indigenous people, one of the things that we're doing there is that we're allowing our mind and our heart and and our spirit to become part of and and part of the land itself and so in our people's language what we say is the land allow the land to speak to us in the way that our mind our heart our consciousness our spirit can hear it and can understand it and can feel it most of all. And so that idea of spirituality um, comes in our dreams as vision, comes in our understanding of what we need to heal ourselves and to heal this land. And it guides us in terms of, you know, the, the reverence and, the, you know, toward the sacredness that we are and that we're a part of and that we have power in. And so that whole aspect, I think, of the knowledge embedded within the land, a medicine person told us, the language isn't lost. The people are lost. The language is there in nature, is there in everything that lives and moves, everything that you're surrounded by. That knowledge is there. That's where all knowledge comes from. All you have to do is re remind yourself and allow that to speak to you in a sacred way. So I wanted to leave you with that thought. Thank you so much. Um, deeply grateful to both of you for sharing your, your knowledge, your connections to your, your own languages and to your own territories. And uh, I want to thank also our audience members for the great questions and for the other observations and comments um, in the in the chat. Uh, this has been an extraordinary session. I'm so so fortunate and honored to be to be here with you. So thank you so much. Um, thank I'll you, just, uh, just oh, my my absolutely. Um, so I know I know Jeanette has to go to another event right away here. So I will uh, I will close. Um, but I want to remind our our uh, audience members that you conversation uh, right after we're finished here. Um, if you go to the, um, the open meeting space and you get a chance to talk with others, um, exchange information and, and, uh, and your thoughts on, on the sessions. Um, and there's also another option, which is the network option. If you click on that link, it, it, it connects you randomly to one other person in, in the group and you can have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. So thank you so much, everyone, for, for your participation and special thanks to our amazing panelists.